Ladies and gentlemen, he's the samurai of student ministry, the networking ninja, a Jedi master of church budgets, the beast from the southeast, the next gen nerd himself, CJ! What's up, my nerds? Welcome to the Next Gen Nerd Podcast. It's Miyazaki May, so all month we're looking at movies by Hayao Miyazaki. Uh, all these films can be found on HBO Max, and they're all out of Studio Ghibli, so I encourage you to check those out, because uh, we've been enjoying watching them. Uh, today's interview, we're actually going to be looking at a movie called Princess Mononoke, one that was on my list for a long time, and I'm glad I had the opportunity to watch it, and we discuss it with Mikey Burgett from the Screen Nerds Podcast, so you guys are really going to enjoy that. Before we jump in, uh, I thought I'd give you a top ten for me. Uh, uh, my buddies on the Sis and Big Pops Culture Podcast recently went over their top 10 movies, and I thought, well, it'd be fun to go over my top 10. Uh, I really like their show, and these are in no particular order, and I'm sure that uh, if you are saying, why didn't you put this on here, it probably is in my top 10, but this is the top 10 that came to mind. As I looked around and thought, okay, what are some of my, my favorite movies? Uh, these are them. The reason why these crawl to the top is because I could watch these any time. Like, if they're on, I'm going to watch them. And uh, so I just, I love these movies. I love these movies, and uh, I'll try and give a little little bit on each of them. So, uh, so again, in no particular order, uh, let's start with Back to the Future. Now, I am good for all of the Back to the Futures, uh, but objectively, the first one is my favorite. I do like the future tech of the second one, but the first one's just the better movie. The better movie. I've watched this thing... 20 times, 30 times. I love this movie, and the fact that my daughter loves it as well means that we watch it together. So uh, I really just enjoy it. It's uh, I love the movie. Love the movie. I want a DeLorean for graduation gift. You can go and get it for me. Uh, number two on my list, Jurassic Park. Jurassic Park is another one that I can watch over and over and over again. Um, I enjoy even the cutscenes on the Lego Jurassic Park game because they're from the movie. And again, the fact that my son really enjoys dinosaurs and actually enjoys this movie makes it uh, even more enjoyable. Uh, this book, or sorry, this movie, I actually had to read the book before I watched it. My mom had this rule growing up that if the movie was outside my rating limit, so I was under 13 when it came out, and it's PG-13, if I read the book, I could watch it. So I read the abridged novelization of the movie book, and that counted, and uh, we watched uh, we watched this movie at my third grade birthday party, like that was uh, that was what we did. I think it was third grade, third grade, fourth grade, somewhere around there. But it was uh, elementary school age birthday party, and I, I love this movie. Uh, the the dinosaurs still are exciting, even though they're animatronic and not CG. Almost like that's good. So Back to the Future, Jurassic Park, Tombstone, the only western I enjoy watching. Uh, I love this movie. It is definitely uh, let's see, I think the only rated R movie on my list. Um, it's very violent, very violent, but, uh, but I love it. I love it. And it's quotable. Uh, in fact, let's see, where is he? He may be at my office. Yes. I have a Doc Holliday, uh, Funko Pop, but he is, he's at my office. So can't show him to you. Can't show him to you, but uh, I do have him holding his little cup that he spins around and, and does his thing. So Tombstone. I love some Tombstone. Empire Strikes Back. It was four movies before Star Wars made the list, and uh, it's not because I don't uh, love Star Wars. I do love Star Wars, but I love a bunch of movies. I love a bunch of movies. Empire Strikes Back was not always my favorite, just like in uh, it was Back to the Future. The first one I saw in Back to the Future was the second movie. First Star Wars movie I saw was actually, I think, Return of the Jedi, and I liked the speeder bike. So that used to be my favorite, but it, now looking at it, I really enjoy the storytelling and the pacing of the Empire Strikes Back. So that's my go-to if we're watching. I love me some Yoda, uh, so I, uh, I enjoy the, the Empire Strikes Back. Number five, It's a Wonderful Life. I used to hate this movie, It's a Wonderful Life, when I was a kid. It was a um, kind of a punishment movie. If I said that I wished my brother was dead, my mom would pop this movie in so we could appreciate each other. Now that I have kids, this movie gets me crying every Christmas season. My kids run for cover when we start watching this movie because they know Dad's going to end up crying on the couch watching this movie. Especially when he can't find Zuzu. Like that, I just lose it. I just lose it. But I do love this movie. Great movie. Great storytelling. Uh, Over-the-top acting, but that's a lot of fun. A lot of fun. Uh, animated movie on here. Animated Aladdin. Uh, came out when I was in elementary school. Great soundtrack. Great voice acting. Great story. Great all around. I love that movie. I'll watch it over and over and over again. If I'm folding clothes, let's put on Aladdin. I'll like that. Um, 
Is it culturally insensitive? Maybe, but I still love it. Love it, love it, love it. Number seven, uh, Ben Hur. This is actually on on my buddy uh, Todd's list. Was Ben Hur the original Ben Hur? I remember watching this movie in high school. I had a teacher who would show us these movies and then share the historical accuracies, and it was part of a history class thing. So uh, thoroughly enjoy Ben Hur. Long movie, long movie. We actually used to show we showed this at a VBS one year. We broke it up over five days, and it was still like thirty five minutes a day. It's a long movie, but it's a it's a good one. It's a great one. It's a great one. Number eight, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. The original one, uh, the original one, not with the CG turtles, uh, with the giant suits that made everybody sick inside because they were so hot because they were sweaty. Uh, that one, I love that movie. Uh, the soundtrack's great. You got MC Hammer on there, so you know, it's it's going to be a good one. It's going to be a good one. Um, I've watched this one with my kids as well. Uh, this is another favorite to turn back to. Uh, thankfully, I've seen it enough times that when the cuss words are coming, I can hit mute. Uh, you know, before Raph shouts it, so all of New York can hear how frustrated he is at Casey Jones. Great movie. Number nine, Ghostbusters. Um, yeah, I, I love to laugh, and this one is full of them. And the number of jokes that I didn't get as a kid watching this that I get now uh, make it even funnier. Great cast, great cast. Um, I am looking forward to the second. Ghostbusters movie uh, in the new trilogy that's coming out. Uh, enjoyed the the first one that came out uh, maybe a year or two ago, and look forward to the next one. Uh, I love me some Ghostbusters. I do. And finally, The Dark Knight. Uh, I was trying to think what Batman movie. <laughs> Funny enough, Batman Forever is on my list. I love that was I was at the perfect age for that one to come out and enjoy that. But really, if I had to pick one Batman movie to watch. Wow, you know, now that I'm saying that, I wonder if it would be the uh, the Adam West made for TV Batman movie. That one actually may trump this one, but I'm going to leave it on there. Dark Knight stays on there. Great story, um, yeah. So I, I love that movie. I'll watch it every every time I get a chance to. So the ten movies that I put on here, movies that I love. If you haven't seen any of these, check them out. If you're looking for someone to watch them with, hit me up on Discord and we'll watch them together because I enjoy these. But Back to the Future, Jurassic Park, Tombstone, Empire Strikes Back, It's a Wonderful Life, Aladdin, Ben-Hur, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Ghostbusters, and The Dark Knight. Uh, All right, well, I think it's time for us to start the interview. Let's get nerdy. Well, like I mentioned at the top of the show, I'm here with Mikey Burgett from the Screen Nerds podcast, and we're going to be talking about another Miyazaki movie. This time, it's Princess Mononoke. And so this was uh, actually, I've, this movie has been on my list to watch for a long time. I was glad for the excuse to go ahead and check it off, and we'll, we'll get into it in a little bit. But first, Mikey, how are you doing, man? How, how's your uh, how's your week been going? It's been going well. It's, uh, you know, it's starting to actually feel like spring, which is a good thing, and Lots of uh, great movies are coming out, releasing, uh, the NFL drafts going on as we're recording. So lots of good, fun stuff for me right now. And so where where do you record out of? Well, I'm out of Florida, so it's been spring for three days, and then it was hu- summer again. So uh, where do you record out of? Uh, I'm out of Tennessee. That's where okay. I'm from. And, and it's actually spring is kind of sprung and then unsprung about four or five times since nice. about March. <laughs> so Chattanooga is one of my favorite places to go. Uh, love going to Chattanooga. Where are you at in Tennessee? Uh, I'm near Nashville. Uh, okay. I do love Chattanooga, but Nashville area is uh, home base. I got you. Very nice. Very nice. Uh, I um, uh, So MDB is another guy that's at uh, is, is an LTN community, and he lives in Chattanooga. So when I go, I went to a conference there in January, and he and I got lunch. So uh, next time I'm in Nashville, I'll have to hit you up. We'll get, we'll get some lunch next time I'm, <laughs> I'm that way. Uh, so, Mikey, tell me a little about yourself. Uh, tell me, uh, you know, what your favorite thing right now in life is, um, and then uh, what nerdy interests you have besides Princess Mononoke. So, like some some of the things that you really enjoy. Yeah. So, like I said, I'm originally from Tennessee. I that's where I grew up, born and raised. Uh, I've had the pleasure of living uh, all across the country. Spent a couple years in Seattle. Spent a couple years in Kansas City. Uh, really, just have. Uh, been brought a lot of different places by God to, to serve and, and to, uh, to live and done a lot of cool stuff that way. Uh, really, one of the things right now that uh, has been kind of enjoying is sharing uh, some things that I'm geeking out about. Uh, what I uh, mentioned about NFL draft, I got a couple of friends who they are knee deep in draft analysis. That's their thing. <laughs> so being able to talk with them about all that's been fun. Have a couple of friends uh, that are pro wrestling fans like me, okay. so we uh, geek out about AEW All Elite Wrestling. So, uh, uh, and then also uh, film 
geeks that I geek out with about uh, films that are out, both new and old. So there's a lot of cool things that been enjoying and being a part of. Uh, nice. As far as nerdy, as far as nerdy interests of mine, uh, I mentioned sports, love sports, uh, both professional and college. A uh, huge fan of that. Uh, also, video games. Uh, right now is like almost a peak season of video games with all the new ones that are being released in the next couple of months. So uh, love playing video games. And then obviously film with hosting a podcast and talking about film. So those are my three main uh, nerdy interests that I have. Okay. A couple, a couple highlights in there. So um, I am not a wrestling aficionado, but I'm told that like right now is some crazy things going on that are uh, kind of bringing it back to like the heyday, like the golden days. I was listening to Zach Workin, who actually works out of Nashville, and he was saying that, um, I don't know, something happened on some pay-per-view show recently, and he was like, it's really good right now. Like, if you are wanting to jump in, now's the time. Is that fairly accurate, what's, what's going on now? Yeah, I would say so, because you have two huge companies. You have All Elite Wrestling, which is kind of the new kid on the block, uh, been around for a couple of years now, and then you have... WWE, which is kind of like the stalwart, the the uh, main uh, big uh, group that's been around, you know, for decades or so. And so, uh, but you have like these two groups, and you have uh, really just a kind of a renaissance, like like your friend said, and uh, and the attention that wrestling is getting, both mm. kind of mainstream uh, and then just in the wrestling fandom. Uh, it's it is it's really just a good time because. It's competition, and anytime there's been competition in pro wrestling, even though it's a predetermined sport, uh, when you have competition between companies, it makes everything better, and so okay. it makes the product it makes the product better, it makes uh, uh, the fan bases better, and so uh, that that makes it fun to watch. Nice, nice. And then video games. So, like, what are your uh, what are you playing right now? Like, what if if when we're done talking, you got thirty minutes? What do you what are you turning on? Uh, well, I've uh, been playing a lot of Splatoon three. Uh, okay. that, that's a, that's a game I love playing. Uh, I just finished the DLC for horizon forbidden West, okay. uh, burning stores. Uh, and tomorrow <laughs> I will pick up, uh, as we're recording this tomorrow, I'll pick up, uh, star Wars Jedi survivor. And that'll be my, uh, game that I'll be playing for <laughs> the next month or so. Nice. Nice. Very cool. Very cool. Uh, a couple of those on my list, on my list. I uh, graduate with my master's degree in, as recording this, 14 days from now. So I'm looking forward to being done and being able to to enjoy some some video games. So I'll, I'll be right there with you, right there with you. So uh, this month is Miyazaki May. And uh, funny enough, it was a combination of um, an episode I was doing with my sister and then you saying that one of your favorite movies was Princess Mononoke. So uh, my sister, her favorite movie, one of them is My Neighbor Totoro. And so uh, I connected with her. We were going to do an episode on that, connected with you. And I said, okay, well, let's go ahead and see if we can flush out all of May. And it was actually a lot easier than I thought it was going to be to do this. Um, and so I've been watching plenty of, of uh, Studio Ghibli films and getting ready for this. And like I said earlier, Princess Mononoke has been on my list for a long time, but I've never actually sat down and watched it. And so uh, I got it. We were, my wife and I watched it and we got done. And her words were, it wasn't bad. It was just really weird. It was like her, her take on it. And it was like the first, <laughs> it was the first studio Ghibli film she's ever seen. First Miyazaki film she's ever seen. And uh, there are definitely some similarities across his work uh, that you can see. But, um, but I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. It definitely was weird. There was definitely some pieces that were weird. Uh, and we'll get into some of that in a little while. Um, but uh, why is it that this is, like in the top list of your movies, why is Princess Mononoke there? Why do you love it? Uh, what's your history with it? Um, why was it that this kind of rose to the top of the crop when you're thinking about things to talk about? Yeah. So when I got introduced to Miyazaki and to Studio Ghibli, I was a junior in college. So this was uh, 2000 or so. And uh, had a friend of mine who knew I loved anime. My love for anime uh, Japanese animation goes way back into the nineties. Okay. Uh, and with like sailor moon and, mm -hmm. and, and those type shows and films, uh, but really didn't get introduced to Miyazaki until 2000 with my friend uh, who was also one of my roommates in college. Uh, he suggested this film 
Uh, so I went to the Blockbuster when Blockbuster was still a thing. <laughs> but it was a thing, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we and we had one on campus that was literally right across the street. So there were students that would walk over from campus to go to this uh, Blockbuster to rent stuff. And so I went over there, uh, rented it on DVD, uh, and watched it and was just blown away by it, loved it, uh, ended up buying a copy for myself uh, and that was my first introduction and it was really just the animation is just beautiful it, it is. is just so simply stunning uh and then the story it's a compelling story and it really is one that draws you in and mm -hmm. really makes you think it makes you feel it has all those things that uh Miyazaki loves to do and yeah and yeah there there are a lot of with his films themes and motifs that kind of string along there's uh the idea of the female protagonist lead uh and, and we see that with uh uh, uh oh i got it. the the princess uh yes. she yeah she so she like you have her you have uh this idea of nature and wanting to protect nature or care for nature that's another theme that's in several of his films and it's really just uh, great storytelling. Uh, I think that's one of the things that he's best known for is his storytelling. And uh, there, that's always been one that even though I've seen a lot of his other films, this film has always been one that's been right up in the top three uh, of my favorites of his. Mm. So uh, just looking up a couple things here. So this movie in particular, I was watching um, uh, a documentary on uh Miyazaki and he was talking about this film. So this was one of the times where he had retired and come out of retirement or this is the last film where he was going into retirement. He did it like 37 times where he yeah. was like, I'm done and I'm coming back. But this one in particular, this movie in particular, it was, it, he wanted it to be his, um, uh, his, his opus, his, his, his swan song, this big deal. And so he wanted to pull all the stops out, wanted to change all the rules and, and because of that, he was obsessive over this project. So uh, as far as the, the the artists and the cells, he redid over 85% of the overall cells in the film. So he would have these artists do it, and he'd go, I'm going to do it over. I'm going to do it my own way. Uh, and so this was his child. Like This was his baby that he spent a lot of time in, which is why I, I, I mean, I've, I watched several, and this one is definitely different. It's different for a lot of reasons. I think this one is more adult than some of the other ones that I've seen. This is definitely not the first one you start with with your kids. You know, uh, My Neighbor Totoro is a good one to start with kids, or Castle in the Sky is a good one to start with kids, but this one, it was violent, it was dark, um, uh, you know, there was, uh, but it was beautifully done. I mean, uh, beautifully done, uh, and so Definitely enjoyable. Definitely enjoyable. Um, and yeah, and so Princess, you don't want to say that her name was Mononoke, but it's not uh, Mononoke. The the original film title in Japan, Mononoke is an adjective, and it's like the forgotten princess or the lost princess. And so uh, when they translated it, they left Mononoke rather than calling it the lost princess or the forgotten princess, whatever it was. Um, but her name is uh, San San or yeah, San. San. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, um, uh, so yeah, so. Yeah, I liked it, man. I really did. Really enjoyed the movie, and um, but it was definitely. Violent. I would say the the weirdest thing for me was the um uh the night creature, the star creature, whatever. Like when he was in normal form, and it was the weird llama thing with a weird Japanese kabuto mask. That mm -hmm. was, that creeped me out. Other than that, uh, I was <laughs> it was fairly easy easy to easy to digest. Um. So all these films right now are on HBO Max. So if you're wanting to, to watch this movie, uh, you can go on HBO Max and watch them. And so uh, another theme that I've noticed in watching these Miyazaki films, I, I mentioned this on my episode when I was doing My Neighbor Totoro, is the films feel like it's not that they're wrapped up in a bow. It's like the bow is ready to be pulled and it doesn't pull. Like it's like he, he ends with this moment of there is hope, there is um, a uh, – they're moving towards a conclusion, but it always stops before the conclusion. Uh, and so without spoiling the movie, that's really the, the same feeling here that we're almost at rest. We're almost at peace, which 
makes it easy for them for this next question, the idea of where would you take a sequel or a spinoff? Because there's so much, and there's no like, there's no Miyazaki cinematic universe, which I would definitely love to see the the flow chart on how these movies could possibly connect. But uh, but where would you take a sequel or a spinoff? Like what area you're wanting to dive in on in this world, which I think is unique um, as are most of his worlds that he creates. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you mentioned uh, before I get to that, you mentioned how th- there, this one is very different than some of his other ones. Really, if you haven't seen Nausicaa, uh, that one is probably the most parallel to this one. It, it has a lot of similar themes and it is kind of has that darkness to it. It's it one that it one, it's a film that was done before Studio Ghibli was actually formed as a company, mm-hmm. but everyone just calls it a Studio Ghibli <laughs> film anyway. Uh, but that, but those are very similar in that. Uh, as in as far as like, how he kind of wraps things up uh, for the most part, but still leaves a little bit hanging. I kind of like that. I mm-hmm. like the fact that a lot of his films are self-contained uh, with the exception being whisper of the heart and the cat returns uh, because the cat in uh, cat returns was in whisper of the heart as kind of a uh, side story of that film. I got uh, you. And then I haven't seen of, those. Yeah, uh, yeah. Whisper of the Heart is actually interesting because that film is essentially about a young girl who uh, likes to write songs, and they do a version of John Denver's Country Roads. Uh, so that's kind of the premise of that okay. one. Okay, all right. Uh, and and there's a part of it where there's a cat involved, and it's kind of like uh, a lot of fantasy and stuff involved, like a dreamlike kind of sequence to it. Well, that character gets like a spinoff film where it's like he's kind of the main star of that one but you're right most of the films are self-contained they're one-offs and i think that's the good thing about miyazaki is he kind of has those kind of one-offs but as far as how you would do a spinoff with this film or a sequel i thought about two ways that you could go about it the first one being uh the continuing adventures of ashitaka who is kind of the main guy of Mm -hmm. the film uh, you could continue on with his story of like, does he travel back home? Because in the beginning of uh, Mononoke, he leaves his village uh, because he's cursed and he kind of has to go on a journey uh, to break the curse. And so the question is, does, uh, does he go back home? Does he continue to have interactions with San? Uh, you know, what, what's his story? What does he continue to do? Uh, and so that would be one route that you can go with. And then the other route that you could go with is the rebuilding of Iron Town. Mm. Uh, Iron Town's kind of like the city of the the film, and and how you have that contrast between city and nature. Mm. Uh, Iron Town's that city, and so how is the city different after the first film? Uh, is it? Uh, it's supposed to be different because Lady Eboshi says that she's going to keep her word and kind of being in harmony with right. nature. Does she do that? Are there new threats that come from outside the town or inside the town mm-hmm. that kind of disrupts uh, what's going on? Uh, really, that would be the two avenues that I would look at if if you're going to do a sequel with this film. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I, you know, I would love to see either of those. Love to see either of those. Uh, you know, especially the first one, him, him going back to his home. I know that there was it's early on. But I, I feel like they had banished him. And it would be interesting to see if they would have him come back. But it also would be interesting to see if Ashitaka has to then wander like a like a Ronin. You know, <laughs> has to has mm-hmm. just wander from village to village and uh and there you go. Instead of a movie, it's a uh thirteen episode uh Netflix series where he goes village to village and is taking care of problems. I'll take I'll take either of those. I'll watch either of those. Um so I put this in here, this this question, uh, and I want to make sure that I'm I'm very clear. Um, in here, there's a lot of Japanese folklore and religious symbology. Um, I completely believe that you can be a Christian and enjoy watching something that doesn't necessarily line up with the Bible. Um, but I would love to hear how you, I mean, because you do a, a podcast watching movies, how do you engage with things that are contrary to your faith? 
and yet still be able to enjoy those things. I would love to hear how you work through some of that, um, which I think is possible, and I'm all for it. Uh, I, like I said, I enjoyed this movie, and I will watch it again. Um, but I would just love to hear your thoughts on 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 dealing with those that issue. Well, for me, I think it's uh, I think it's good to understand differences in in cultures and uh, other faiths, and and understand where people are coming from. Uh, I think that's one thing, especially because with Japanese culture, you have Shinto influences, you have Buddhist refer- uh, 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 references, you have those kind of influences there. And so understanding kind of their context of what they believe and what they think uh, is is a good way of in understanding how it relates to Christian faith mm. uh, and how there are things that you can connect with. And then there are things that are, that are incompatible, but finding those avenues of where you can find common ground and find discussion. I think Paul has always been a good example of this uh, on Mars Hill, where he would understand Greek and Roman cultures and influences so that when he spoke to them, uh, he knew kind of where the touch points were to be able to reference, okay, here's what we, you know, understand this to be, but here's what I believe this to be. Mm. Uh, And so having those kind of understandings and cultural points uh, to speak the gospel and, and find those common grounds, I think is good. And, And there are those places, even in Japanese culture that you can see where, uh, you can relate to the gospel into whatever context it is. And so Mm. for me, it's being able to understand what, what their beliefs are, where they come from and, and then being able to engage with that. Cause obviously there's going to be some things that I don't agree with because uh, of my faith and and being a follower of Jesus. Uh, But I can understand and respect where they're coming from and know where they're coming from to then be able to engage with them. Yeah. I, uh, I wrote an article for Love Thy Nerd, uh, How to Enjoy Heresies Without Being a Heretic. And uh, a lot of this is, is some similarity in between those two. Um, I talk in there, too, about the difference between a personal conviction and scriptural mandate. You know, that there are going to be some people that watch this movie and say, I can't, I can't watch it because I can't deal with the weird demon god things that really bothers me and in those situations i tell them don't watch it like by all means stay away from it stay away from it that's fine um if that's a conviction you have then then hold on to it but it's when we take those convictions and impress them on someone else and go you shouldn't watch that because it makes me feel bad or you shouldn't watch it because i think you should you know and so i think there's there's some leeway there too to be able to say no, I'm doing this because I really want to understand these people. I, I'm watching this because I look at it as entertainment. I don't think that any of this is real any more than Wizard of Oz is real. Uh, and so um, I think that's uh, excellent points, though, in understanding where they come from, understanding their culture, because this is bathed and birthed in their culture. Um, and there's so many things, like as I've looked at uh, background and Easter eggs and things like for these movies, there's so many things that are not – necessarily communicated culturally to us because we just don't understand uh it's just not part of our culture and so i uh, i'm with you i think it's a, a a good way to look at that as far as um uh wanting to know and and knowing the difference knowing the difference and i think too if you have kids and you watch this with your kids there are plenty of times that i've watched things with mine and had to sit down afterwards and go all right now let's talk about this piece what does this piece have to do you know how does this relate to our faith and uh having good conversations with your kids is is helpful is helpful well, let's uh, make it a little more, a uh, little more light, a little more light here. So, let's say that you were in this movie. You are Mikey is the hero of the movie, um, and so I just have a few questions there. I'll answer them as well because I've been thinking about it. Um, if you were in Princess Mononoke, and so in here, uh, Princess San rides a wolf, rides a full size wolf, and so and so does Ashitaka. Also, at times. Has done that. What giant animal mount would you choose for you? Like if if they were, if we see other giant animals, uh, giant boars and things like that. So what giant animal mount would you say this is what I would want to have in this world? I always loved the red elk that Ashitaka rides. <laughs> yeah, I, I always I always yeah. thought that was the coolest animal. And uh, there's another film that's uh, that just released last year called The Deer King. It's very similar to this film. Uh, I compared it. I almost it almost feels like a one to one comparison, 
Uh, but the main character in that film rides a elk like uh, animal. And it reminded me so much of Ashitaka and the elk that he rides. So mm. that would be my choice uh, just because it's one that's fast. It's uh, able to, to jump and do a lot of the things that you need to do on the run. Uh, that would be my choice. I got you. Um, so I was, uh, I've been told that I didn't see in the movie, but uh, a giant flying bird of any kind, like flight is always like my go-to. Like I would love to be able to fly. So that'd be great. Um, but if I was on a land animal, I would want something with some like some girth and some weight, like a lion or um, or, or some kind of feline like that would be fun. Uh, I mean, a wolf too. I mean, let's be honest, riding a wolf would be awesome. Uh, <laughs> that, would, that would still be good. This still be good. So, uh, so the wolves and the monkeys had this forest kind of home where they lived. Uh, if you were uh, wanting to set up some kind of sanctuary, what would that look like? Like what biodome would it look like? Biodome, biome or habitat would that look like where you go? This is where I would want to set up camp. Uh, I would probably say like the forest or the mountain. Mm. I always, uh, I've always found those places to come out to be kind of the most serene and places where you just kind of, relax and reflect and kind of recharge mm. uh anytime i've been on a retreat or anytime just e even just going out in, in the woods it just kind of has that kind of peaceful mentality to me and mountains have always been something majestic and, and just awe-inspiring to me and and having lived in the northwest uh, a couple years and living uh, around mountains all the time it was just kind of cool to just go outside and just see them uh, and just kind of have that kind of peace about mm. it. Uh, th that that would be my choice. I got you. So you know, it, it makes sense. That you talk about the place you've lived. Uh, for me, I've always lived here in in Florida, and so being on a beach like is serene to me. You know, the the waves crashing over and over again. I mean, that's that's home. That's home. Now, I guess a lion could live on the beach. Uh, you know, or if I flew on a giant seagull, that would work on a beach too. But um, but I would like to be. I, I always like being on the water. I love being on the water. Uh, even when we go in the mountains, it's like I need a lake, I need a river, I need something to be, <laughs> I need moving water would be great uh, for me. Um, well, cool. So the last question here. Um, so uh, Princess San used uh, knives and swords. Um, uh, Ashitaka used a bow and arrow. What weapon proficiencies would you want your character to have, your persona to have uh, in this world? Like, what are you? They also had. They all, they also had rifles, I guess, too, because Iron Town used a bunch of firearms. So, what what weapon proficiencies would you want your character to have to use in this uh, in this situation? Uh, I would go with bow and arrow. I just yes. like the way that you can just like fire them off. You do it on the run. You can do it. Uh, in stealth, uh, when I'm doing any kind of first person shooter games, I'm kind of a sniper type, mm. uh, uh, fighter. And so, uh, that's one of the things with a bow and arrow, you can be like a sniper and just take people out that way. So for me, I would go bow and arrow cause it'd just be quick and easy and, and fast. Oh, same, 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 same. See, I'm a, I'm a runner gunner. But I still would want a bow and arrow for that. I'm not up close and personal uh, if I'm playing. So usually I, I'm I'm kind of that mid range, mid range, uh, you know, rifleman kind of thing is where I typically would go in a in an FPS. But um, but yes, uh, and two, even the way that that archery was depicted by Miyazaki, it's like yes, I definitely want to do this. I definitely want to do this. Uh, I've got a a range out back that I set up sometimes to do uh, do some archery. So I do enjoy that. That would definitely be the same. Definitely the same. Well, cool. Uh, any other thoughts on Princess Mononoke? Any things that are left on the plate that you go, hey, I want to want to talk about this a little bit before we move on to screen nerds? Yeah, there's one story. And I always like uh, telling the story when I've talked about this film. It's one that I learned uh, back in the day when when I was kind of finding out about this film. Uh, and it was kind of the the story behind how Princess Mononoke got to America uh, prior to this film, some of the other studio Ghibli films had been distributed in the U S uh, but had been heavily cut. They had been bad dubbing. It was really just a mess. Mm. And this time, and, and for this film, uh, Miyazaki wanted to make sure that it was done the right way, that it right. was, perfect and it was the the vision that he intended and ironically enough miramax was the distributor of this film and harvey weinstein was 
in charge of Miramax at this time. And he was wanting to do cuts and changes and all this stuff. And the, the lore of this film is, is that Miyazaki sent a note and he sent a samurai blade Mm -hmm. to (laughs) the, the offices at Miramax with a note that says no cuts. Mm -hmm. And it was like, no cuts, no nothing. You're doing it this way. And it ended up being, such a great film. Uh, the English dub, they got such great actors uh, to to do the voiceover for it. And they had Neil Gaiman, who uh, wrote Sandman, the mm-hmm. prolific author. He's the one that did the English uh, script for oh, the okay. film. So it was, uh, uh, it, it was, instead of it being kind of a second rate, third rate kind of a job, they went full blown, you know, first class and really it was this film and then spirited away that kind of really had that full renaissance of Miyazaki Mm -hmm. in North America. Yeah. So uh, I was just looking, I I remembered seeing that it, it was actually Nausicaa was the one that they had ruined. They had, they had cut it up and it became Mm -hmm. warriors of the wind. And I remember when I was doing my research on that for next week's episode that I'd seen that story. Um, And you mentioned uh, the English actors, which my sister, uh, loves the original English adaptation of My Neighbor Totoro and hates the Disney version of it. Uh, I'm guessing if when you watch this movie, it was probably the original English dub, and now they've re- Disney's redone it as well with better-known voice actors. What are your thoughts on on those two? Is there one that feels more like home, or are you, you enjoying both? That's in, they're different children. Same, you love them the same, but they're just different children. No, actually, this one is the same. It's just okay. it's one dub. They never... Uh, because Miramax was is kind of a subsidiary of Disney at the time, uh, so they they just used the same actor. So it, there never was any oh. changes from from this dubbing. Okay, well there you go. Never mind. Never mind. Uh, <laughs> I had I, I mentioned it on I guess it'll be last week's episode uh, that uh, I had to go and find a bootleg version of it for my sister because she couldn't take the the Disney voices because she grew up watching the original dub and the voices didn't match and the, the emotion didn't match. And she said, I can't watch this. I can't even watch it. Uh, so I had to go and find it for her so she could enjoy it. Well, very cool. So uh, you are a fellow podcast host uh, and found your show on the self-promotion section of love that nerd and started listening to it. Tell me about screen nerds. Yeah. So screen nerds podcast, I always like to describe it as uh, a place for film lovers uh, to enjoy film, uh, to celebrate film, to uh, talk about the films that we love and share those loves with one another. And really, that's what uh, the podcast is about. It's uh, There's episodes that delve into new films. Uh, mm. Those are right out of the theater reactions, call those uh, quick screen episodes. So immediately out of the theater, get my thoughts on uh, the the film I just saw, like what I liked, what I didn't like, uh, what stood out to me, just media thoughts right out of the theater. Uh, and then rescreen episodes are some of my favorite films of all time. Uh, rewatching them again, then having sharing my thoughts on what I thought of it the first time. What were some thoughts there? What are my thoughts after rewatching the film? Uh, what were some things that stood out this time around? Uh, and, and really, it's just kind of just sharing thoughts and sharing love of film. And, and really, that's what Screen Nerds podcast is about. Very nice. Very nice. And so if they want to find the podcast, uh, I, I found it uh, easily. But where should they go to look for it? Where, where's probably the best places to go and find the podcast? Really, it's wherever you get your podcast. So ch- just search out Screen Nerds podcast. Uh, you can find it on wherever it is, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, Good Pods, Amazon Music, wherever it is that you get your podcasts, you can find it there. Very nice. And uh, Mikey, if they want to follow you on social media, what are the best ways to follow you on social media? Uh, For Screen Nerds, you can just uh, find on Twitter at Screen Nerds Pod. And then on Facebook, just search Screen Nerds Podcast and you can find the page there. Very nice. Well, Mikey, thank you for coming on and talking with us uh, for Miyazaki May about Princess Mononoke, and uh, we'll talk again soon. All right. Thanks for having me. 
Well, thank you guys for listening to the show. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss the next podcast, which is going to be Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind, and we're going to be talking with Asia Filipiak, who is from uh, Asia the Girl, a Twitch stream. And sorry if I butchered your last name. Let's be honest. I don't know how to pronounce that one. Did Gave it my best shot. Gave it my best shot. Um, but if you want to follow us on anything else, uh, all our socials, uh, our Discord link, our merch stuff is all in the show notes. If you can't find the show notes, you can email me. Um, uh, my email is nextgennerdpodcast at gmail.com. You can email me there, and I can get you set up with whatever you need. Uh, I appreciate you guys listening. I really do love to, to hear from you guys. If you share a comment, uh, then um, I would love to read it on the show. So share that for us, and, uh, and we'll put it up there. But I think that's it for this episode. So until next time. Peace out. See you, Crest. <laughs>